We're here now with Janine hightower Stolito. She is a CEO of Atomize, very interesting fintech company. Welcome to the show, Janine. It's the first time on Kitco. Pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. Janine, tell us about Atomize. You were telling me offline about uh, what the company does and its ability to tokenize assets. So tell us about that process. That Atomize is uh, a company that's looking to modernize and frankly revolutionize the markets for commodities. We are building both a tokenization platform and a marketplace to digitize ownership of physical assets um, by way of tokenization and a marketplace by which uh, both investors and commercial users can exchange those tokens on the platform. Okay, so what kinds of assets right now are you looking at uh, tokenizing? Our first set of products coming to market will be in the metal sphere. So um, our first product coming to launch in Q4 of this year is a palladium token. Um, we'll be adding platinum, gold, silver, and then excitingly in Q1 of next year, starting to move into base metals, mm -hmm. uh, cobalt, copper, nickel, uh, and then looking to expand into other metals and other commodities uh, after we accomplish those. Okay, so tell us about this tokenization process. How does it work? So you take a metal like palladium, and then what's your next step? So it, it's it's actually really an interesting process because there's a huge technical component to it, but there's yeah. also a lot of business process that goes behind the scenes to make a reliable, um, auditable product exist. Mm -hmm. So the 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 process itself is is blockchain based. So you're taking an inventory. Um, creating that record and then minting tokens that represent titled ownership to very specific identifiable pieces of metal. But the business process that goes around it is actually a little bit more complicated. We actually um, take in metal from the tokenizer or the, the asset provider, the, the entity that's bringing the metal to be um, digitized. We um, hold that at a secure facility, which is a tier one vault, uh, which is Brinks. So the palladium itself, the bars will come into Brinks. They're held in a cage at Brinks. The inventory tracking is, is kept by Brinks. It's provided to us. We mirror that. We have a third party auditor look at it. And then we do the process to create digital tokens, which is called minting, where um, tokens are created uh, that identify each token to a specific bar um, or specific unit that's at Brinks. And those tokens are then put in the provider's wallet. So now instead of the provider owning physical palladium, they own digital title to that physical palladium that's sitting in the vault at Brinks. And are those tokens divisible? Like, let's say you have one token for one ounce of palladium. Um, you can sell that mint of a one ounce of palladium to a hundred different investors. Is that possible? Yeah, so so that's actually one of the, the great things about the platform, that the idea here is that we're bringing efficiency to ownership of physical material. So rather than having to go through the logistics of buying spot material uh, on the open market, through the OTC market, dealing with logistics to ship it, insurance, um, getting your own storage facility for it. You can actually own physical material through digital title. So that's really one of the benefits. And once you have that digital title, it also becomes extremely easy to transfer the ownership to new new owners. So you could um, you know, simply sell uh, your token on the platform without actually having to move the physical um, to a new location and you can create the efficiency for that marketplace. You can... Um, buy you know anything down to one one hundredth of an ounce of palladium on the platform um, so we actually have been very careful to construct the product to meet all the regulatory standards in terms of delivery the metal is fully redeemable so if you if you want to take your metal out of the vault you can hit a button on the platform and mm -hmm. say i'd like to redeem this and have the metal um, be shipped to you uh, because it is fully redeemable um, but yes it is it's fractionalized down to one one hundredth of an ounce okay interesting and the metals that's uh, those are in the vaults, and what what are they doing while they're being tokenized? They're just they're just being uh, kept in the vaults in inventory. Are you loaning them out, for example, or are you doing anything else with it? No. So so we so the metal is owned by the token holder. So once it's owned, we have no rights to it. It is in name at Brinks to the owner of the metal. So we mm -hmm. as Atomize are the service provider, but we actually are not the owner of the metals at any time. Um, customers themselves, we envision a market in the future that they could loan the materials or they could pledge them um, in a financial transaction. Um, so those are all really exciting developments that once yeah. you have ownership in digital form, it becomes really easy to, to make something pledgeable. And so who will you be targeting mostly? Is it institutionals uh, uh, players or is it uh, retail investors? 
No, our, our focus is institutional investors. We think there's a need in the marketplace for institutions that want to access these types of products, but have no way to access um, access them. Some, some of the products don't even have futures trading on them. Yeah. Futures can be expensive and sort of painful to manage. Um, accessing physical can also be logistically challenging. So we think um, small to medium sized institutional investors, you know, hedge funds, family offices, um, those that have discretion to operate in a new and evolving space of digital assets, um, but can see the benefits that they bring to their investment portfolio are the right customers for our platform. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so you can presumably do this for any asset, right? Tokenize any asset you want. Why did you start with uh, metals? So it's a great question because we do hope to extend our product across a variety of commodities and even into assets that aren't deemed to be commodities but exist in the physical world. Um, we see ourselves as, as an entire portfolio of physical assets coming onto the platform. We started with metals. Um, for a very good reason. I've spent my entire career in, in market development and there's two things you need in a market. You need both buyers and sellers. And we're extremely fortunate to have a large number um, uh, our backers come from the metals and mining space. And so we do have some initial um, participants that are very anxious and very excited to tokenize some of their inventory on the platform. Um, and they, you know, are, are in the metals and mining space. So that's where we're starting. Um, so we think that's one, you know, real opportunity for us in terms of being able to have inventory on day one and, and really sure. meaningful size inventory. And secondly, and, and maybe even more importantly, that commodities have really been a very hot sector for the last um, you know, year and a half, two years. The, the prices in some of the commodities have been um, you know, making the front page of the New York Times, excuse me, the Wall Street Journal. Um, so it's pretty interesting, I think, for investors to be in the space right now. Um, and they're actually like the direct investment into some of the new emerging technologies that exist today. There's a lot of focus on green initiatives, focus on electric vehicles, focus on other commodity driven sectors. And rather than having to acquire equities um, or another way of acquiring interest in the commodities that are powering these sectors, you can actually come to Atomize and directly invest in those raw materials that are actually pushing the economy forward. So I want to talk about commodities and your outlook in just a bit, but I want to go back to uh, the blockchain technology itself and why you think tokenization is perhaps more beneficial for an institutional investor than let's say an ETF or a futures contract. Because like you said, some, some of these metals that you do tokenize are unavailable or difficult to be exposed to. But if you're getting into stuff like, you know, copper or, or, or perhaps even the precious metals down the line, I mean, there's, there's readily available uh, contracts uh, in the futures markets available for that already. So there, there's different use cases. One, um, the direct ownership through Atomai should be much more cost efficient from an ownership perspective and an ongoing ownership perspective than some of the other vehicles that investors can access today um, on a competitive basis. And we do intend to bring a whole host of metals to market that you really can't invest in through an ETF uh, or through a futures contract today. There really isn't any viable options for cobalt, for example, um, but there is huge demand for cobalt and huge interest from the investment community in that type of product. Um, so mm -hmm. that is really one aspect from an investment perspective that makes Atomize's platform particularly suited to institutional investors. Interesting. So what about what about fees then? Yeah, can you tell us about the transaction costs of using using a token? Yeah, so there, there's a, two components to the transaction cost. One is the ongoing um, uh, management fee, which is inclusive of storage of the physical, which is pretty uh, aggressive, I think, compared to other um, platforms in the marketplace, as well as managing it yourself. Um, we do achieve wholesale rates, so they're pretty competitive from an asset management fee. Um, there are transaction fees on the platform, but again, compared to transacting on an OTC basis or even on an ongoing basis in futures, pretty competitive. Obviously, we've carefully chosen our fees to not only um, be amenable to our business plan, but also to be really competitive in the institutional marketplace. Do you see yourself scaling out to also open up operations to retail investors as well? So we don't see ourselves as directly servicing retail investors, but we certainly can work with partners that could access retail investors directly. So they could open an omnibus account with us. Um, if, if there's banks or other entities that are say dealing in gold and silver, but not other precious metals or not other base metals, we certainly could be service providers to institutions that they themselves carry retail investors. Okay. And you mentioned earlier that the commodities have been uh, on a tear in the last year. You're right. I mean, they have been. Can you maybe outline a few reasons as to why they've performed so well in a price perspective? Yeah, I think, well, there's a couple of things going on. I think there's a huge rebound in the economy from the shutdown uh, that we saw during COVID from last year and the economy is starting to steam. 
uh, steam ahead. Uh, people have money in their pocket to spend. And so there's a demand in the construction universe. There's a demand for electronics. There's a demand for vehicles. They're all powering the economy. There's global growth, which certainly fuels the desire for, um, for goods that um, are all dependent on commodities to be built. So I think this is an ongoing trend. The second thing I think that's happening, um, especially in the metals that we cover very closely, are the green initiatives. There's a global climate summit going on right now. Um, and there's a lot of interest in how we turn the globe as a whole to a greener globe. And many of the metals that are part of our initial portfolio are key to bringing that realization uh, to, to the planet. And so I think we'll continue to see demand for these metals um, either by, um, you know, consumer demand um, by producer, you know, sort of looking at their business and seeing what's best from a PR and from a marketing perspective to service those same customers, and also by government regulation as they have green initiatives, as they have carbon emission initiatives, and most recently even methane um, caps in the U.S., there, there's a, certainly a lot of interest in how do you turn this globe green. And so I think some of these metals are following that same trajectory. What about what about the supply chain issues? You brought that up earlier. So do you think that could be uh, rectified anytime soon? I actually was reading an article uh, just a couple of days ago, if you were to lay out all the containers on the sev from the 70 ships docked in LA, uh, those containers could be uh, laid out from the West Coast to the East Coast back to back. So there's, there's a lot, yeah. <laughs> You know, it's an interesting problem. Someone told me that they they hadn't seen they, they're on the west coast uh, near the port of LA, and right. they hadn't seen as many container ships ever off the coast no. as are sitting there right now. And it, it is pretty incredible to think about. Um, I think about it in my personal life, just with Christmas coming up, and, and what that means for you know acquisition of, of things we need for for December twenty fifth. So I think there's a couple things going on. I think um, labor shortage is is the biggest that's there, and that's a very politically driven um, element right now. So I, I don't see any short term solution. Um, in the current market. I think COVID is certainly one aspect of it, but but the labor shortage um, is certainly another really big impact in terms of, of how um, supply chain is going to function. It, the supply chain is complicated. We, we didn't spend too much time talking about this, but Atomize is also venturing into the supply chain universe, um, building a platform for commercial participants, producers, manufacturers to engage on one network um, that has will have a marketplace. It will have tracking and tracing of materials through the life of the supply chain. And part of this is really driven by these current current dynamics where we see a better way to not only um, be able to source materials, but be able to know their origins, know their carbon footprint, and all the data that goes along with it. I don't think we have the solution for the labor shortage of getting materials from point A to point B, not yet anyway, yeah. but, but that's certainly part of the problems that exist today. Okay, so just to clarify, so Atomize is storing the data on the blockchain technology? Is that how you're... Yeah, so one of your questions before was, was why blockchain? You know, there's, there's a lot of ways to build this type of platform, but blockchain is particularly useful um, for a couple of reasons. One, because it has immutability in terms of its record keeping. You can't change the data once it's been put on chain. And in both the asset back token product as well as the supply chain product, we will have the ability to capture data from the material. So if it is um, a low carbon nickel product, if it is um, child labor standards, if it's carbon footprint information, that can all be added to the permanent record keeping for that contract. So if you own, um, you know, whether it's uh, an ounce of metal, um, or you own a forward contract for delivery of nickel, the platform itself is being built so it can be able to capture this information as it comes to market. Right now, these products are commodities, they're fungible. There really is no difference between, um, you know, one, one metal sponge to another, assuming it's the same grade. But as you have other information that comes out, um, you know, whether it's, again, ESG standards, labor standards, governance standards, et cetera, it does create some variation in the actual qualities of the metal that maybe aren't necessarily part of the physical element itself. I'm interested to understand a little bit more about the uh, blockchain technology in terms of uh, usage in the database system. So how does it compare in terms of efficiency and, let's say, ease of use to legacy systems like SQL, for example? So a couple of the differences between the system today, again, is that the 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 network itself is distributed. So any participant on our network is actually able to share in the information and see it. So it's not necessarily captive to one single controlled entity, which is of course the idea behind blockchain. Our instance of blockchain is a little bit different. Um, we're running on a platform called Hyperledger Fabric, which was developed by IBM um, for our universe, which is an institutional universe, which is a universe transitioning from legacy systems and legacy um, products to digitize products, it's really important for us um, from one key aspect in that it is permissioned. 
permission in blockchain means that it's not an open network. Um, you and I simply couldn't go on the network and log in and um, see what's there and participate. We'd actually have to go through KYC um, that's managed by Atomize and be permission to join the network to be able to, to access any information. And so that's really one aspect that's particularly important. Um, and then lastly, again, as I mentioned, the record keeping and the legacy of information that exists on the platform is, is particularly valuable and something that we think will be incredibly useful as this industry grows. Okay. Pivoting away from the uh, blockchain tech, uh, I want to talk about a buzzword that's been uh, popping up in the internet, which is the metaverse. So as you know, um, that I mean, I was just reading last night, Nike is starting to uh, digitize some of, its, uh, some of its assets and prepare for that kind of environment. Do you see yourself partnering with a big tech company down the line and say, hey, look, they might need some sort of digital version of gold or silver for some sort of some some, some use case in their in the in their in their virtual reality and they'll might come to you, Janine, and say, Hey, we'll need this token. Can you can you provide one for us? It doesn't have to be gold or silver. It could be any yeah. asset that they want. And, and, that, and that's right. So, so Atomize is a service provider to industry. We're starting in the metal space, but we can certainly tokenize anything. I mean, tokenization is the function for what we're doing um, with the services surrounding tokenization um, that I mentioned earlier. But yeah, we, we could theoretically tokenize any type of asset. Um, the key here is for institutional customers and for customers that want is how do you verify that asset? How do you store the asset? Um, but if it's if it's Nike and you're creating nifties, it has a different outlook than if yeah. you're creating tokens on gold. Um, it's all about the use case and what the ultimate consumer of that token is going to need in terms of standard settings. Well, can you maybe give us a I don't want to say teaser, but can you give us an outlook of maybe what this next asset class could be that you might work with? So I, I can't give you a teaser at this point, but we are um, hard at work at looking at a variety of different asset classes, All not right. just the next segment, but but certainly um, a host of segments after that. And, and like anything, you know, there's the right time for an asset, there's the right participants, there's the right market and use case for it, um, but there is a huge amount of potential and a huge amount of assets that we're looking at. And finally, Janine, you've worked in the fintech space for quite a number of years in a variety of different fields and companies. What would you say are some of the biggest developments and changes in this space over the last, I would say, 10, 10, 15 years, you know, notwithstanding blockchain, of course. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think the, the realization that efficiency can drive and power a marketplace is really important. I saw it when I was working at the Options Exchange, um, the International Securities Exchange, which was a fintech startup in the early 2000s. It brought a whole um, new way of trading options in the US. And then ultimately over my 14 years there, a lot of knock-on effects and market structure changes that ultimately benefited investors in the end. I see the same thing coming in this space here, uh, in commodities, in tokenized assets, in tokenized commodities, that that there is a new way of transacting that not only will have immediate impacts to investors in this space, but long-term impacts on how these markets develop over time. I would love to see a more liquid, more efficient, more continuous, transparent marketplace for, for commodities in general, um, and especially in the ones that are, are, are our areas of early focus. But what was your reaction when blockchain technology started becoming adopted over the last, I would say, really five to seven years or so? Because you, you started off, I mean, Basically, at the beginning of your career, Bitcoin didn't exist yet. So there was this transition phase. What was your reaction when it first came out? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. I started uh, my career in the 90s in internet investment banking, and yeah. there's a lot of parallels to what's taken place in in the blockchain space over the last couple of years. The, the first, you know, instances of, you know, no one knows what this is, and it, everyone sort of is, is a naysayer about what the technology could provide to sort of the phase we're in right now, where there's a scramble from both large and small size institutions, as well as retail investors to understand it. I get a huge number of calls from my former colleagues saying, could you just could you just tell me about it? I don't really understand what's happening. Could you give me a primer? And all the way through through banks, most banks have a blockchain group, a blockchain working group, a DLT working group right now to understand the tech and what it means for them. And from an investor perspective, people are dipping their toes in really meaningful sizes into crypto assets and acceptance of digital assets as a whole. But where I think really things are headed is that blockchain becomes an underlying strategy for every business, the same way that businesses don't have an internet strategy today that is apart and different from their overall business strategy. You don't think about it that way. I think where we're gonna to get to ultimately is that blockchain is a general purpose technology that powers the foundation of most businesses, or certainly businesses where data and information information are really important. Um, and that'll just be the de facto way that businesses transacted uh, in the next few years. 
Well, we did see a very rapid rise in adoption. Would you say adoption has more or less matured already amongst institutional um, investors and uh, firms? I think it depends on the investor class. So I think for, you see in firms that have a lot of discretion, hedge funds and family offices, a huge amount of adoption from those types of customers. Um, more constrained investors like mutual funds, pension funds, et cetera, um, maybe have adopted less. But I think everything is on a transitory spot right now. Um, before joining Atomize, I was at Gemini and spent a lot of time with institutional investors in the crypto space. And again, there was a huge push to really understand it. Um, I always said people don't, don't want to be the first mover, but they don't want to be too far behind the few first movers. So people are really prepared to jump in um, when their, their discretion allows them to. Um, but but I do think that there is a, a huge transition taking place right now. And where is this transition taking us? Final question, I'll let you go. Where is this transition taking us in the uh, grander scheme of things? We're seeing entire countries, I mean, albeit they're, they're, you know, they're countries with very different macroeconomic mm -hmm. landscapes than ours, right? El Salvador, for example, adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. Uh, so this big push, this big transition that you're talking about, what's the future going to look like? There are so many aspects of this world taking place right now and changing. One big theme is um, central bank digital currencies. Um, that's certainly being discussed uh, a lot in Washington and, and by all of us in the, the blockchain and crypto community. And I think that will take time. I think the US regulators in particular are very measured and very methodical in their approach to any sort of large scale change. But I do think it's really encouraging that they are spending a huge amount of time focusing on this space, trying to understand it. And ultimately they will take the, the actions they want to um, when they're ready to do it. It's too hard to tell where things are going to come out. Um, but I do think the advent of the Bitcoin ETF, again, it's a future based ETF, but it is, you know, a step forward in terms of the SEC's outlook for Bitcoin to approve an investable product for, for, for customers, um, albeit on the futures product, but certainly, you know, access to retail investors through their legacy brokerage accounts into a Bitcoin ETF is a really big step forward. Yeah. But more broadly speaking, I do think, you know, as you think about digital assets and where this is going, I think every company, every entity really should start thinking about blockchain. And, you know, there are a lot of aspects where settlement takes more than instantaneous for, a, a, you know, a, a, a delivery of an asset for fiat. And in this day and age, there are tools that are better. Blockchain can enable this. Um, people should be looking towards these types of tools to allow for this type of, of transaction. Excellent. Janine, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you for watching Kiko News. We'll have more. Stay tuned.